Hello, I'm Dr. Mark Taylor and I'm a lecturer in civil engineering. So this is unit seven and in this unit we're going to look at signalling and train control. So this is a seventh unit out of ten and in signalling and train control we're going to look at signals and train protection systems. So the aim of this session is to detail the historical development of the block system of train control. I'm also going to describe the design principles for signalling layouts. And I'm going to illustrate the safety issues relating to the signalling and how they may be overcome. So at the end of this unit, you should be able to explain the fixed block signalling system used on most conventional railways, design a block signalling system for a given length of track and traffic volume, argue the advantages and disadvantages of different automatic train control technologies, and outline the principles of interoperability on European railways. So we're going to start off by having a look at the St Jude's Day storm back on the 27th of October 2013. So here we can see a Telegraph article asking the question, was the St Jude's storm really that bad? The article pretty much said that the railway infrastructure was shut down unnecessarily. So here we can see a BBC news article, again questioning whether or not the train companies were too cautious. So what did the train company say? Well, Emma Wright from Southwest Trains said that a blanket cancellation was not a decision that they ever take lightly. And she commented that in her experience, some of the extreme weather we've had in recent years, with really heavy snows and floods, has become more and more something that has to be done. In terms of the passengers, we had passengers stranded, and one passenger, George Thompson, commented while stranded at Gatwick Airport, the opposite of the British Bulldog spirit. Flights on, buses on, but trains all cancelled on Southern Railway lines. Overcautious. And Stuart Jackson, MP for Peterborough, tweeted, How come a gust of wind disables the whole of the East of England rail infrastructure with the economic consequences too? So I'm now going to show you a series of photographs taken by Network Rail and other contractors during this storm event. And we'll start off here with this photograph of a reasonable sized tree that's fallen across the line. Now if a train struck this, this would cause a derailment. In this photograph, you can see the tree has fallen. It's not landed on a track, but it's struck an overhead line cable. So in this situation, the tree is actually causing damage to the infrastructure beyond the track. Here you can see an advertising hoarding is blown over on a platform. This represents a significant hazard for passengers standing on the platform, but also, as you can see in this case, it's actually struck a train. Here you can see an image taken in Brighton of an established tree which has been blown over and has now blocked both tracks. Here we can see an image taken in Dorchester where a tree is blown over. The tree was located on an embankment, so it may have caused issues with the stability of the embankment as well. Here we can see in this image that the heavy winds have caused damage to the overhead line electrification cables, rendering them useless. Here you can see another example of the wind. In this case, it's blown over a tree, which has then struck the overhead line electrification. So here we can see an example of the problem. This was a little too close for comfort. Fortunately, the driver saw the obstruction on the line and managed to apply the emergency brake and managed to stop just in time before he struck the tree. So in the aftermath of this incident, over 200 fallen trees were cleared. Train services were also cancelled in the Netherlands, Denmark and Sweden. So does precaution have its place? I can imagine the journalists would have had a field day if there had been hundreds of accidents and potential fatalities as a result of them keeping the railways open. So we're now going to have a look at the development of signalling in the railways. So trains initially travelled on site. That is, if the driver saw an obstruction, they would stop. So initially, low frequencies and low speeds, so obstructions were usually a minor issue. However, as frequencies and speeds increased, there could be another train on the track, which could be hit at speed. They then realised that a form of control was needed. 
and this led to the first form of control, the time interval signalling system. So the first train of the day would proceed as normal. It would travel from station A to station B. Then the next train would be allowed to leave after a set time. The time was set such that the next timing point could be reached safely. In theory, this would mean the trains would be kept separated. However, if the first train had a problem, there was no warning for the second train. And this led to many collisions. So the Armour Rail disaster happened on the 12th of June 1889. A train hired for a Methodist Sunday school seaside outing to Warren Point ran into difficulties on a steep hill. When uncoupled to enable the steam engine to pull the front wagons to the top, the rear carriages rolled backwards to collide with an oncoming regular train, killing 80 people, 22 of them children and injuring 180. This was the greatest rail disaster in Europe until then. It still ranks historically as by far the worst in Ireland and the fourth worst in the UK. So absolute block signalling was the solution. The line was divided into blocks between the stations. The aim is to prevent more than one train being in a block at the same time. Early signals were operated from the foot of the post, but signal boxes controlling sections of the line quickly followed. The control of the signals and points was by levers and steel wires. Communication between boxes was by electric telegraph. The initial block size was limited by what could be seen and practically worked from a signal box, and this was originally only about 320 metres of track. With a train ready to start and depart the station, the signaller sets the signals to line clear. On seeing a signal, the driver takes the train out of the station. Upon passing each signal, the signal is automatically set to danger. So in turn, each block is now protected again. So if a train has a problem, the block in which the problem train is in will be inaccessible. Therefore, a collision is prevented. But this system is not perfect. So some problems arose when trains became heavier and faster. Primitive braking systems meant that trains were often difficult to stop. And this resulted in many rear end collisions just after signals at danger. So the solution was to add an intermediate signal on approach to a stop signal. And this signal is known as a distant signal. The signal provides a warning of the status of a stop signal ahead and it advises the driver to proceed with caution and prepare to stop. A second train approaching a protected block will now be warned so it can adjust its speed on approach to the stop signal and then stop safely. So most of the time a collision is going to be avoided but it's still not perfect. So despite the addition of distant signals, collisions still occurred. Drivers still misjudged the approach speed. The solution was to move the signal in advance of the section it's protecting. And this provides space to stop and this is known as overlap. The next train is not allowed to enter block A2 until the preceding train has cleared the overlap. A train accidentally passing the stop signal would therefore be able to stop so subsequently the collision will be avoided. These principles form the basis of modern day trackside signalling systems. So mechanical railway signalling installations rely on lever frames for their operation to interlock the signals, track locks and points to allow the safe operation of trains in the area the signals control. So usually these are located in a signal box and the levers are operated by either a signalman or the pointsman. To assist the operator in determining their functions, each lever in the frame will generally be uniquely labelled. A large track diagram is positioned with an easy view of the operator, which clearly shows each lever number adjacent to the symbols representing the items of equipment that they operate. Levers are commonly coloured according to the type of equipment they control. The code of the colours varies depending on the different railway administrations, 
For example, in British practice, the following code generally applies. A red lever controls a stop signal or shunt signal. A yellow lever controls a distance signal. A black lever controls a set of points. A blue lever controls a facing point lock and a white lever is a spare one. Brown levers are used to lock the level crossing gates. The lever handles are usually of polished unpainted steel and the signalman operates them with a cloth to prevent rusting from the sweat from their hands. So underneath the floor level where the levers are is a mechanical lever frame designed to harness mechanical advantage to operate switch points, signals or both under the protection of the interlocking logic. So the mechanical advantage applied by the levers is then transferred to a series of either rods or chains around pulleys. And this is where we leave the locking room of the signal box. And then these rods and chains are then connected to the physical equipment on the track side. So here we can see some rods and cables with their guides. These are then connected to the equipment that they're moving on the track side. The rods for pushing, and the cables for pulling. So the large cable runs meant that signalling was physically demanding. It was only able to control short sections of track. And the introduction of electric and pneumatic levers helped extend the range. However, they were still limited by line of sight control. And thousands of signal boxes being required made this really inefficient. So a way was needed of detecting trains without having to physically see them. So now we're going to have a look at some of the methods that we use to detect the trains on the track. So a track circuit is a train detection device, or more accurately, a train absence device. The track circuits can vary in length from 18 metres to over a mile, and each one must be physically insulated from its neighbour. The electrical current is fed into the track circuit at one end. So when there isn't a train on the track, the current passes through the relay and causes it to open. And when there's a train on the track, the current is diverted through the wheels and the axles and away from the relay, which causes it to close. The operation is fail safe, as any breakage or loss of power will cause the relay to close. So track circuits have a number of benefits. Firstly, they protect against dangerous errors from signalers who may not have seen or noticed a train. They also extend the range of the signal boxes, as line of sight is no longer necessary. They also have the benefit of detecting broken rails, as the circuit will not be made if the rail is broken. Track circuits have limitations, in particular in wet weather conditions. For example, leaf mulch may also affect the ability to detect the train. Axle counters are an alternative. Axle counters work by counting the number of axles entering and comparing with the number of axles leaving a block. So axle counters are good for tunnels. They're also used on steel bridges where the rails are secured directly onto the girders. They can be problematic to restore after maintenance, so care must be taken. They're also not able to detect broken rails like track circuits. A counting head or detection point is installed at each end of the section and as each train axle passes the counting head at the start of the section a counter will increment. A detection point comprises two independent sensors therefore the device can detect the direction and speed of the train by the order and time in which the sensors are passed. As the train passes a similar counting head at the end of the section the counter compares the count at the end of the section with that recorded at the beginning. And if the two counts are the same, the section is presumed to be clear for a second train. So each axle counter consists of a pair of electromagnetic coils mounted on either side of the railhead, as shown in the figure. One being the transmitter and the other being the receiver. A magnetic field is established between the two coils. When a train wheel is running on the rail and between the coils, the magnetic field is so distorted that the induced voltage in the receiving coil changes direction, which registers the passage of one wheel. So we have two sets of axle counters installed at the two ends of a signalling block, and a comparison of the wheel passage count of the two axle counters verifies whether there is a train occupancy in the block. 
for example, when the axle counts of the two counters are different, or whether the train has moved away from the block when the axle counts of the two counters are the same. So there are three main components to the system. The first being the outdoor equipment, so the detection points, the axle counters connected to the track and the electronic junction boxes, the information transmission equipment, i.e. the cables, and then the indoor equipment, which is the evaluation, indication and resetting devices, which passes information to the control room. So now we're going to have a look at coloured light signalling systems. So why use coloured light signals? Well, mechanical control limits the distance between the signal and the signal box. The use of coloured lights increases this distance indefinitely. The meaning of the signals is conveyed in three ways. Firstly, the colour of the lights. Secondly, the position of the lights. And third, whether they're flashing or in a steady state. In terms of signal form, signals can show one, two, three or four aspects in the UK. An aspect is simply a single lamp or LED array. So a four aspect signal would have four single LED arrays. Here we can see an example of a two aspect signal. The image here shows a three aspect signal. So the lights can be red, yellow or green. The lights at the top are what's called a position light junction indicator signal. And this indicates to a driver which route they need to take where the track deviates ahead. The indicated route is based on the degree of angle of the illuminated arm. Here you can see two four aspect signals. The four aspects being red, single yellow, double yellow and green. So red means danger, stop. Single yellow, caution, prepare to stop at the next signal. Double yellow, be prepared for the next signal to be a single yellow. And green, the line ahead is clear. In the UK, flashing single or double yellow lights are used with the signalling of some facing junctions. So the small signals located on the ground a few metres in advance of the turnouts are called position light ground signals. They consist of one white and two reds or two white and one red. The display of lights at 45 degrees means proceed cautiously towards the next signal, being prepared to stop. So the signals at junctions need to inform the driver which way the junction is set, ensure the driver reduces speed, ensure the switch cannot move when the junction displays a proceed aspect. And the three methods of informing the driver are the provision of a position light indicator above the signal, providing standard alphanumeric route indicators, and offsetting the signal for the diverging route, what's called a splitting distance signal. Here you can see on the left an alphanumeric indicator and in the middle a four aspect signal with one route indicator and then on the right a four aspect signal with a double route indicator. So sometimes indications are given to drivers at the distance signal to show which route has been taken and these are called the splitting distance signals. These signals have one head for each route at the junction ahead and each head shows an appropriate aspect so now we're going to introduce some of the design concepts for signalling layouts. So the number of aspects is determined by the frequency of the trains. For a low frequency route, two aspects is likely to be fine. A signal every few miles showing red or green, preceded by a distant signal showing yellow or green. Two signals would be a braking distance apart. If the frequency increases, stop signals will need to be brought closer together. So if stop signals are brought too close together, a stop signal would end up being unacceptably close to the next distance signal. Therefore, convention is to combine these into three aspect signals. And these signals are then spaced at least a braking distance apart. And spacing depends on the maximum line speed. So where the speeds are high and the frequency intensive, close headways may be required. Therefore, braking distance cannot be reduced. Therefore, additional warning needs to be provided. 
Therefore, double yellows are provided, and these are included in four aspect signals. So you can see the three aspect signal sequence. If we follow the direction of travel, the first signal is green, which means proceed. The next signal is displaying a proceed aspect. The second signal is yellow, which means caution. Proceed, but be prepared to stop at the next signal. And the third signal being red, which means danger or stop. Here we can see the four aspect sequence. So if we follow the direction of travel, the first signal showing green, which means proceed. The next signal is displaying proceed aspect. The second signal showing double yellow, which means preliminary caution, proceed, but be prepared to find the next signal is displaying a single yellow aspect. The third signal, single yellow aspect, means caution, proceed, but be prepared to stop at the next signal. And then the final one, number four, shows the red aspect, which is danger or stop. So signals can either be controlled or automatic. For controlled signals, the signaller selects the required route. Provided no section of the route is allocated to another train, the route will be set. The signal aspect at the start of the route will change from danger to proceed, either green to yellow or single yellow, depending how far the route is clear. In automatic and semi-automatic signals, an automatic signal will change to yellow as soon as the previous train has cleared the safety overlap of the next signal, then to yellow, then green as the train proceeds. Generally, by default, signals work to automatic to reduce signaler's workload and ensure proceed is shown as soon as possible. Where a signaler needs to decide on priority, e.g. at a junction, control signals are used. So the positioning of signals is influenced by where trains need to be stopped, e.g. stations or junctions, to avoid stopping trains where possible in viaducts, tunnels or halfway along a station platform, to avoid blocking level crossings, and for signal sighting so that they can be seen clearly. Safety is important. For example, line of sight and contrast with background are important issues with regards to drivers and signals. Where line of sight is a problem, a banner repeating signal can be used, e.g. at stations. So we're now going to have a look at what's called token block signalling systems. So single line tracks is a common occurrence in the Highlands of Scotland. Where single tracks are used in both directions, there's potentially a high risk of error. Many single tracks are signalled using signal control blocks and interlocking to prevent this. On lines where traffic is low, a traditional and low cost approach is the token block system. So the tokens themselves take various forms, including staffs, tablets, balls and keys. The principle is that the driver of the train must be in possession of a token to enter or occupy part of a line. Token machines, linked by telegraph, increased the flexibility of the system and allowed asymmetric working. So the token would be released by the signaller and then handed to the driver in the locomotive as the train passes by. Physical tokens require railway employees to be present at the track side. The development of electronic tokens removes this requirement. The driver requests a token from the signaller by radio. If accepted, the train receives a token and it's displayed on a screen in the cab. The token is then released by the driver on completion of the route. So you can see the driver of train 1A88 handing back the last token to the neon signaller in 2017. And this was the last time a physical token was transferred between a driver and signalman on this route. So I'm now just going to show you a short video by Network Rail, which is an introduction to the world of signalling in the network. Britain's rail network transports 3 million passengers and 400,000 tonnes of freight a day, with hundreds of trains using it at any one time. All this traffic presents us with a safety challenge. 
Trains are guided by rails, so it's impossible for them to swerve or pull over. Trains are heavy, can't stop quickly, and frequently operate at speeds which do not enable them to halt within sighting distance of the driver. Under these circumstances, one might assume that trains are prone to collision. In fact, rail is the safest mode of transport in Britain. And that's because trains are carefully controlled. And it's our responsibility at Network Rail to control them. Signalling is a control process Network Rail uses to operate trains safely over the correct route and to the proper timetable. The two key features of this process are line-side signals and the block system. Trains can't collide if they're not permitted to occupy the same section of track at the same time. So the network is divided into sections known as blocks. Normally, only one train is permitted in each block at any one time. The British Rail Network uses line-side signals to advise the driver of the status of the section of track ahead. Most line-side signals are in colour light form, but a significant number of semaphore signals remain on secondary lines. The semaphore consists of a mechanical arm that raises to signify go, or lowers into the horizontal to signify stop. The most modern signals have four colour aspects. A green light indicates clear. A double yellow indicates that the next signal will be a caution. A yellow signal indicates caution and that the next signal will be red. And a red means stop otherwise known as danger. It's prohibited to pass a signal at danger. The British Rail Network was originally controlled by thousands of manned signal boxes located at regular intervals along the lines. My name's Stuart Sentence. I'm the signaller at Utoxeter Signal Box. This is the most traditional form of system on the railway as it is at the moment. And a lot of this, as you see, it goes back to how the original railway started. As far as we're concerned, the universe begins at Caberswell, over to the right, and Sudbury there, and we're in the middle. This set of blocks tells me where the train is between myself and Caberswell, and this set of blocks tell me where the train is between Sudbury and myself. These levers here, will operate the uh, points for the crossings into the loops and the sidings. They'll also work the semaphore signals. To prevent a collision caused by human error, a safety system called interlocking protects the railway network. Interlocking is a series of mechanical devices that prevents a signaller operating appliances in an unsafe sequence. What you have here is what looks like a simple lever system. It's actually, if you looked underneath the box, it's quite a complicated interlocking system. The interlocking system prevents me giving a green signal to approaching train unless I set that route and that interlocking system safely first. It sounds simple, and it basically works simple, but actually what it does is very good. Lever frame signal boxes, while effective, aren't sufficient. They only cover a short section of line and manning them with skilled operators is expensive. Now I can pull the signal off. Number two. Some of these you'll see me pulling quite hard. That's because there's a lot of cable on these. Some people can't actually pull up at all. Well, a lot of it's fairly hands-on. You see the trains. You've got control over the trains and the job itself. It's a good job. A better jobs I've ever had, without a doubt. The next big leap in rail signalling control came with the electronic age and the advent of power signal control boxes like this one in Derby. This location opened in 1969 and when it did open it represented a massive step forward uh, to the railways in the way that trains are signalled. 
Well, these lines represent the mainly the Derby to Birmingham main lines. This signal box actually took over 84 mechanical signal boxes, making it a far more efficient way of carrying out signaling. Routes are set by pressing buttons on a large control panel. Each section between buttons represents a stretch of line formally controlled by a lever frame signal box. It's very easy to work around. The signalling system is very user friendly and very easy to see the layout of the trains and where they're coming from and going to. The presence of a train is indicated by these red lights on the panel. They're activated by the completion of an electrical circuit for when the train's wheels pass over the track circuit. The operation of the signalling equipment is carried out by pulling and pushing the actual buttons that are set in the panel. To set a route, you press the entrance button, you press the exit button, and the signalling system between detects all equipment that's located between the two signals. Once that's in the correct position, the signal will clear for the train to proceed. To take the route out, we simply pull the exit button and the route will drop out. Power signal boxes are regulated by a relay room, a little like a giant mechanical computer. This is the interlocking room underneath the operating floor of the power signal box. And in here are all the banks of relays. And these relays relay all of the information from the touches of the buttons upstairs from the signaller outside to the points and the track circuits and the level crossings. Relays are interlocking electromechanical switches. When a signaller sets a route in the upstairs control room, you can hear the switches clicking, working out how to set the signals and switches and crossings, and whether the set route is safe. These cabinets are where the equipment in Derby PSB reached the modern era. These allow the transmission of the train head code, the four digit running number that we saw on the panels upstairs, to be transmitted to adjacent signal boxes to give them advance notification of that train coming so that train can be routed further down the line. Powered signal boxes are effective and safe, but at Network Rail, we are now introducing an even more efficient form of signaling control. Compared to the oldest lever box signal boxes, this is a world apart. It's like an air traffic control centre, basically, but controlling trains instead of aeroplanes. My name's Jason Jones, I'm a signaller, and I work at Ashford IECC in Kent. The IECC stands for Integrated Electronic Control Centre. All the signalling in this signalling centre is controlled by computers. A timetable is downloaded every day, and any alterations, etc., are all programmed into the computer. When everything's running on time and all the trains are in their correct place and there's nothing else going on, the computers are all running the job and I am literally just sitting here monitoring. Hello driver, you're sitting on Area 83 Ashford, over. At any time there could be an emergency of any description and that's when I will then step in and take over from the computer. I will turn the computer off and then run the trains manually using the keyboard or the trackable system that we've got. On this screen here I can see the exact layout of the stations and the tracks. I can see where the trains are, where the red line is. Each red line indicates the location of the train. I can see where the trains are heading for, what route they're taking by the white line. That's what the computer has set up for that train to use. We can also see the signals, what the driver sees out on the track. The red dots indicate a signal that's red. We've got a single yellow. We've also got a double yellow. And obviously we've got the green signals, which means then you can proceed at line speed. The computers that Network Rail uses in this type of location are specifically designed for this type of system. They use various safety protocols and various fail safes. You get three computers working in tandem with one another, and before any decisions are made, two of the computers have to agree with one another. Ashford covers a huge area, right from the Kent coast at Folkestone, but right the way into central London. That is the equivalent, yeah, of, of hundreds of the old style lever frame signal boxes. We don't just deal with standard trains here, as well as the commuter trains that we run. We also run the high speed trains into St Pancras and the uh, Eurostar trains that come from Paris and Brussels. The high speed trains are run using a totally different way of signalling trains 
from the old style and conventional signals. The uh, high speed line is signalled using cab signalling where the driver gets a display in the cab and that tells him when to stop his train and start his train and what speed he must run at. The trains travel up to 186 mile an hour um, and that's just too fast for the driver to be able to see signals out on the track. All the systems, whether you're in a lever box or you're in this type of modern technology, it's all designed to fail safe and that is any failures, the signals go back to red. This job carries a lot of responsibility. You are responsible for people's lives on the trains, the public, the drivers, the track workers. You do have a fair bit of responsibility. No matter how much technology changes, the one thing that remains the same is the safety and the security of the trains out on the track. So we're going to look at token protection systems now. And we're going to start off by looking at the Harrow disaster of 1952, and in particular the lessons learnt from this accident. The Harrow and Wilston rail crash was a three train collision at Harrow and Wilston station, in Wilston and Middlesex, now Greater London. During the morning rush hour of the 8th of October 1952, 112 people were killed, 340 were injured, 88 of these being detained in hospital and it remains the worst peacetime rail crash in the United Kingdom. An overnight express train from Perth crashed at speed into the rear of a local passenger train standing at a platform at the station. The wreckage blocked adjacent lines and was struck within seconds by a double-headed express train travelling north at 60 miles per hour. The Ministry of Transport report on the crash found that the driver of the Perth train had passed a caution signal and two danger signals before colliding with the local train. The reason for this was never established, as both the driver and the fireman of the Perth train were killed in the accident. The accident accelerated the introduction of automatic warning systems, and British Railways agreed to a five-year plan to install the system to give drivers an in-cab audible and visual warning when nearing a signal at caution, actuated by magnets between the rails. So despite the best efforts to design safe signalling systems, humans make mistakes. The biggest problem is a driver failing to observe a stop signal. This incident is known as a signal passed at danger or SPAD and was the case at Harrow in 1952. The train protection systems have been developed around the world as a backup to the driver in these situations. Systems include the ACFA in Spain, Le Crocodile, KVB and TVM in France, the INDUSI and LSB in Germany and the European Train Control System, ETCS. In the UK, AWS and TPWS operate, which are similar to the above systems. So we're now going to look at train protection systems, in particular the UK Automatic Warning System, or AWS. So the Automatic Warning System was approved for use in British Railways in the 1950s. Since then it covers almost all the British Rail network, the goal is to remind the driver that he or she needs to slow down or stop using an audible and visual in-cab indication. If the driver fails to acknowledge the reminder, the brakes will be automatically applied. Note that the critical word here is acknowledge. If the driver acknowledges a signal, no further action is taken by the system. Here you can see a picture of the AWS equipment installed on track. The AWS ramp contains a pair of magnets, the first permanent, the second an electromagnet linked to the signal to provide an indication of the signal aspect. The ramp is placed between the rails so that a detector on the train can receive the indication data. The equipment on the train includes an AWS receiver mounted underneath the train. The receiver detects the magnetic fields from the AWS ramp on the tracks as the train passes over them. In the train cab, either a clear bell or a warning horn provide audible indicators to the driver. A sunflower indicator is also used to provide a visual indication. So in the cab, the black indication advises the driver that the society signal is showing a green aspect or all clear. It also advises the driver the audible warning has not been acknowledged and if not acknowledged, the brakes will be applied. 
The yellow and black indication advises the driver that a warning indication has been acknowledged. So the train first passes over the permanent magnet and the onboard receiver sets up a trigger for the brake application. Next, it passes over the electromagnet. If the signal is green, the electromagnet is energized. The brake trigger is disarmed, a bell rings in the driver's cab and a black indicator disc is displayed. In this case, the driver takes no action. So if the signal is yellow or red, the electromagnet is de-energized, so a horn sounds in the cab and the visual indicator shows all black. The driver is then given two to three seconds to acknowledge. If the driver fails to acknowledge the warning, the automatic application of the train brakes is triggered and the train will be stopped. The visual indicator shows black throughout. If the signal is yellow or red, the electromagnet is de-energized, so a horn sounds in the cab. The visual indicator shows all black. The driver must cancel the warning, otherwise the automatic application of the train brakes is triggered. If the warning is cancelled, the driver is still responsible for applying the brakes as appropriate. If warning acknowledged but driver fails to apply brakes, there's still a risk of collision. At Ladbroke Grove in London, 1999, a Thames train fitted with AWS passed a red signal, SN109, in a SPAD incident. The train continued into the path of a high-speed Great Western train heading into London. Unfortunately, 39 people were killed in the accident. The public inquiry found that poor signal sighting and driver inexperience were key factors. The accident would have been prevented by automatic train protection, or ATP. So an increasing number of railways around the world are provided with automatic train protection. ATB provides a continuous or regular update of speed monitoring for each train and causes the brakes to be applied if the driver fails to bring the speed within the required profile. The main reason why existing railways have been slow to introduce ATB is because of cost. The costs are high as historically it's been difficult to detect speed stroke location data and allow for the different braking profiles of trains. In the UK, ATP had been looked at before the Ladbroke Grove incident, but a cost-benefit analysis concluded it would not be cost-effective. So now we're going to have a look at the UK Train Protection and Warning System, TPWS. So after the incident at Ladbroke Grove, there was public outcry for better train protection. TPWS system was adopted as a more cost-effective alternative to full ATP. It does not prevent signals being passed at danger, but minimises the consequences by stopping the train immediately. It also reacts where driver acknowledges AWS passing caution signal, but does not brake. The TPWS equipment includes a loop installed on the track, as shown here on the left, and equipment installed in the cab. The TPWS overspeed sensor immediately applies the brakes if a train is going too fast towards a signal at danger. The TPWS train stop sensor immediately applies the brakes if a train passes a signal at danger. The image here shows the layout of the TPWS equipment. The overspeed sensor is located between 50 and 450 metres in advance of the signal and that depends on the gradient and the line speed. The loops of the OSS are installed a known distance apart that should not be traversed within a predetermined period, usually one second. The train stop sensor is located at the signal. The two loops are immediately adjacent to each other. So when the signal is set to danger, the loops will be energized. The train will pass over the trigger loop and a timer will start. Once the train crosses the arming loop, the speed is known. If the train is travelling too quickly to stop, the brakes will automatically be applied. So when the signal is set to danger, the loops again are energised. If the train detects the trigger loop, immediately followed by the arming loop, the brakes will be applied. Trains travelling up to 75 miles per hour should be stopped safely within the overlap. The safety effects of TPWS are limited by the fact that it is provided only for stop signals and that it cannot have any effect at caution signals. 
This means that there's a range of speeds at the higher level which will be excluded from full protection. In spite of this, it's suggested in published data that 60% of accidents due to SPADs will be prevented by the installation of TPWS at critical locations. This is achieved, it said, at 10% of the installation costs of a full ATP system. The TPWS system does not replace the existing AWS system, and the two systems work in parallel. Despite the almost universal application of the Automatic Warning System, or AWS, signals are still passed at danger without authority. Although the causes are many and varied, they most often result from driver error. The problem is primarily one of distraction, lapse of alertness and concentration, or misunderstanding. Following the industry decision in 1994 not to adopt a network-wide automatic train protection system, British Rail and Railtrack initiated the SPADRAM project to develop an affordable train protection system that would provide intervention braking in these circumstances, with the objective of reducing or mitigating the severity and consequences of signals passed at danger, or SPADs as they are known throughout our industry. The result of this research and development is the Train Protection and Warning System, or TPWS. TPWS has been developed to operate in conjunction with the existing automatic warning system and to provide last resort emergency braking at the point where the signal is being passed at danger or where the speed of the train is such that it's likely to pass a signal at danger. TPWS can be fitted to both passenger and freight trains and interfaces with all current braking and signalling systems. Let's begin by looking at the protection afforded by TPWS. At selected signals, a train stop will initiate emergency braking should a train pass the signal at danger. Because the train stop loops are positioned immediately adjacent to the signal, it also follows that a train starting away against the signal at danger will experience intervention braking before any significant speed has been attained. In these circumstances, the train will almost certainly be stopped within the overlap where one exists, even a short overlap. However, if the signal is passed at speed, distance becomes a critical factor. If this speed is around 40 miles per hour and the train is fitted with enhanced emergency braking, the train stop should bring the train to rest within the standard overlap. In those rarer circumstances, where the approach speed exceeds 40 miles per hour, the train may be brought to a stand a considerable distance beyond the signal and thus beyond the overlap. This stopping distance will depend on both the approach speed and the braking performance of the train. To partially address this problem, an overspeed sensor is located approximately 300 to 400 metres in the rear of the stop signal. If a train approaches the signal at danger, at a speed higher than the speed setting of the sensor, intervention braking will occur. In this case, a train fitted with enhanced emergency braking and travelling up to 75 miles per hour when tripped should still be brought to a stand within the overlap. TPWS will only be fitted to signals where a significant risk has been identified. Let's look at the track equipment. As we've already seen, the TPWS train stop is located immediately adjacent to the stop signal to which it applies. It consists of a pair of loops in the centre of the track, which are only energised when the signal is exhibiting a red aspect. When energised, both loops emit a low frequency radio signal. The first, or rear loop, is the arming loop, and the second, the trigger loop. The TPWS overspeed sensor will normally be located between 200 and 400 metres in the rear of the signal to which it applies. The spacing between these two loops will determine the train speed which is being detected. Like the train stop loops, these are only energised when the corresponding signal is exhibiting a red aspect. The TPWS trackside equipment can be interfaced to all forms of signalling currently in use on rail track infrastructure. 
At the heart of the trainborne equipment is the TPWS control box, which interprets the messages received from the track-mounted loops and transmits these to the train's control and braking systems. A TPWS communication aerial is mounted beneath the train and a TPWS control and indication panel is fitted in the driving cab. The TPWS control and indication panel provides visual indication of TPWS brake intervention as well as indications of fault or isolation conditions. The panel also provides a train stop override facility to enable a signal to be passed with authority. A temporary isolation switch is also provided, usually in the driving cab, but located within the engine room on some types of locomotive. Now let's take a brief look at TPWS in operation. A train approaching a signal at danger should be braking so as to be able to stop at the signal. However, if the driver fails to reduce the train speed sufficiently, transit of the over speed sensor loops will provoke a brake intervention. Quite simply, TPWS has determined that the train is going too fast to be able to stop at the signal ahead. The red brake demand indicator starts flashing on the control panel in the driving cab. The driver must now acknowledge the warning and reset the TPWS by pressing the TPWS and AWS reset button on the driving desk. The brake demand indicator will then change from a flashing to a steady red indication. However, the train will remain under emergency braking until 60 seconds have elapsed. Although a danger signal was passed without authority, TPWS intervention braking was able to bring the train to a stand within the standard 183 metre overlap. The TPWS train stop loops, energised when the signal is at danger, will similarly provoke a brake intervention if a train starts away from a signal at danger without authority. Across the network, with most trains fitted with TPWS and the equipping of signals where the consequences of a SPAD carry significant risk, the system will be able to prevent most SPAD-related equivalent fatalities. Extensive trials of TPWS have been undertaken on Thameslink lines, where Class 319 electric multiple units have been fitted. Under test conditions, where both over speed sensor and train stop loops have been provided, a class 319 train not fitted with enhanced emergency braking and travelling at nearly 70 miles per hour has been stopped within the standard overlap. Completion of the Thameslink trial has been followed by the national implementation of TPWS, which is now underway. Let's just summarise the main benefits of TPWS. It provides automatic train stop facilities at all fitted signals. It provides automatic over speed control on the approach to fitted signals. It can also provide over speed protection on the approach to major speed restrictions and on the approach to buffer stops. Although TPWS doesn't provide the same level of protection as that afforded by the automatic train protection system, which continuously monitors the train, it does afford a significant improvement in rail safety across the network. So I'm now going to introduce some of the concepts used for signalling on high-speed railway lines. So in a classic network, signalling relies upon coloured signals or lights or semaphore signals. The signals are placed to protect block sections of track. Traditionally, signalling requires drivers to see and react to the line side signal. In high speed rail, this becomes impractical due to the slow reaction times and high stopping distances. In high-speed trains, in-cab signalling is generally used. Line-side signals are not present on high-speed lines. The principle of blocks is still retained. 
Signals are transmitted to the train through rails or rail side beacons. The signal is displayed on the driver console. Known as a transmission volume machine or TVM or train to track transmission in English, the TGV lines are divided into blocks 1.5 kilometres long. Block boundaries are indicated by line side signs for information only. The blocks are shorter than the train's braking distance. This allows increased line capacity through shorter headways. This table summarises the maximum speeds, the blocks and the headways for a range of TVM equipped TGV trains. So each block has properties. These include the length, the profile, including the gradients and the maximum speed. Information about the presence of other trains is also provided. The onboard computer calculates the target speed for the end of the current block and the end of the next block. The driver is responsible for changing the train's speed. The computer will bring the train to a stop if instructions are ignored. This table shows a summary of the TVM signal meanings. And you can see, for example, at the top, the 300 in green means a steady line speed indication for normal running. It means the train may proceed at the maximum permitted line speed as indicated. If we go down the list, we can see eventually there are three zeros in red, which is a stop indication where the train must stop at the next block marker or signal.
So finally, we're going to have a look at the European Train Control System, or ETCS, and the European Rail Traffic Management System, ERTMS. So I want you to watch the following video, and I want you to consider the following questions. What is an ERTMS system? How does the system know where the trains are? What are the benefits of the ERTMS system? And in relation to capacity, why can the system achieve a higher capacity than traditional absolute block signalling systems? The European Rail Traffic Management System, ERTMS, is currently the world's most advanced in-cab signalling technology. It replaces existing analogue communication systems and line sight signals with wireless technology and an in-cab computer to operate trains more affordably, safely and efficiently. Instructions, including line speed, are sent wirelessly from a signalling centre to a computer on board an ERTMS equipped train. The onboard computer will process the information to tailor the speed limit and the braking distance according to the profile of each train. Each train's computer will pinpoint its exact location through an electronic beacon, also known as a Belize, installed on the railway track. Information is transmitted back to the control centre at regular intervals to confirm the train is travelling according to plan. If required, the built-in train protection system will take control and automatically prevent the train from travelling too fast or getting too close to another train. ERTMS improves safety. It provides a fail-safe system to guard against the potential risk of human error. ERTMS brings savings to the railway. The costs of installing and maintaining the railway will be lower, as line-side signals will not be needed. ERTMS can assist in boosting capacity. The railway can potentially run more trains as the system provides greater flexibility to tailor train movement. It improves performance. ERTMS replaces life-expired railway infrastructure dating back beyond the 60s, significantly improving the infrastructure's capability. ERTMS is the most advanced train control system in the world and is increasingly being adopted by world-class railways globally. It was successfully brought into operation in March 2011 on the Cambrian lines between Shrewsbury and Aberystwyth and from McCuncliffe to Puffelli. Network Rail and its industry partners have a long-term plan for Britain's railway. ERTMS is a major feature and by the early 2020s, several major main lines connecting some of our biggest towns and cities will benefit from this unique cutting-edge technology. So that's the end of Unit 7. In the next unit, we're going to look at traction and rolling stock where we're going to consider electric and diesel traction and look at different train types. So I'd just like to say a thank you to Richard Llewellyn for his help in preparing this presentation, in particular for his help with the various photographs he's provided and also the animations to demonstrate how signalling systems operate. So thanks for listening and bye for now.